Well, let's get started here this morning. So everybody stand, we're going to pray together. We just want to honor God in, what, in, in, his, in his place, in our lives, the important place that he carries, that he stands in, what he means to each one of us, what he's accomplished in us, and what he's wanting to accomplish through us. Lord, we're just thankful today, Father, for the privilege, as Paul wrote, that you have counted us worthy and you put us in your service and your yeah. ministry. That, Lord Jesus, you looked down from heaven, you saw something, something of yourself in us. You saw a reflection of who you are in us because we are made in your image. And so, Father, we are thankful today that I believe you're drawing the best out of each one of us as men and women of God. We pray not only for those that are here, but for those who are part of our fellowship who are not here today. We bless them as well. We stand with them, not only in this country, but in other places in the world. Father, those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we stand together. We, we Father, want to speak words of life and encouragement over each other. Father, strength. And Father, uh, just the holiness and the righteousness of God that, that you bestow upon us by your Spirit. We're so honored by all of that. We bless you today. We thank you. And we claim the promise that where even two or three or more are gathered together in your name, you said, I will be there. So, Lord, your presence. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence. Thank you for your presence in our lives and in this meeting today, this time together. We just give you the glory. We give you the praise. We honor you. We bless you this day. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing we stand with people that struggle today. We pray for those that are trying to find their way and try to find their place. That, Father, that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you, would, you, you who are the way maker, that this morning that you would be that kind of a person to each one of our brothers and sisters. We just thank you, Father, for guiding each of our steps according to your word and that you order our steps. That, Father, that they are specially made for each one of us. We're just thankful for that. Thank you for the fellowship we have together. We bless you, Lord. We pray this and we believe God together about it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May be seated. <clears throat> <clears throat> I was thinking this morning on the way up here that uh, the Bible talks about paths. P-A-T-H-S, about paths, paths that we walk, and that uh, in the body of Christ, uh, there's people, a prophet, prophetic people, and they, they sometimes help identify paths. They see things, they're seers, and they see things that people need to, to, to know and to hear so they can walk in the path that God's got for them. And then I think <clears throat> apostolic people... Uh, they're supposed to be people who actually, uh, as one person said, take it from the artistic to the architectural. That is, how do we actually do this? How can we, how can we do these things? Much of what Paul wrote was <clears throat> either trying to instruct or deconstruct sometimes. Yeah. You're doing this wrong. You need to do it like this. But it was very specific, uh, which I'm very thankful for that we can read about the mind that he had, the thought, the thoughts that, that the Holy Spirit gave him about <clears throat> how to do what it is that we're trying to do. It's one thing to say, oh, I'm going to preach the gospel, thinking and exactly how does one do that. And I put, you know, put in the newsletter this week something I'd been thinking about, that, about uh, people uh, lose a husband, father, have a funeral, and I would use a scripture about that God said he would be... Um, a support to the widow, and he would be the father of the fatherless, and all this, and and I would speak that with great words of comfort in life, and it's like it never dawned on me, like, well, how does he do that? I've never actually seen him come down here and start living at somebody's house and acting like a daddy or whatever. He didn't do that, but he 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 instructed the church to do it, and we become that extension of who he is. 
So, and then that's, that's where you need to know the specifics. How do we do this stuff? Uh, so uh, I think we, we, we can't spend all of our time, uh, as uh, Billy Eppard said, revelating about stuff. Just yeah. we got all this great revelation about stuff. And it's like, but that doesn't actually do anything. It excites my mind, stirs my spirit. And then I go home and do nothing. So apparently that's not enough by itself. We need everything that God's got for us. We need everything that, everything in the body of Christ. We need apostles, we need prophets, we need evangelists, we need pastors, we need teachers, we need the body of Christ, we need gifts of help. We need all these things if we're gonna actually accomplish what we're supposed to do. So anyway, I just wanted to share that with you this morning. Uh, Dan Dyer's got some things that he would like to share with us today. And he told me, he said, I had a great word. He tell me about it, I said, sounds good, preach that. He said, but on the way down here, that's what happened, got interrupted. So we're having an interrupted message this morning. So brother, please come. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Apostle. I actually had to pull over on the side of the road and, and write on the back of what I was going to talk about today. But, uh, you know, j just some food for thought. If, if anybody wants one of these, uh, I've done this a few years ago with our leadership team that, you know, the Apostle Paul had said, you know, you know, it starts out saying, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And then he goes and he talks about, you know, I got to forget the things that are behind, set my gaze on the things that are ahead, press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of Jesus Christ. And so, so I've got a handout if anybody wants one, just kind of go through, kind of reflect on your calling, uh, what, what you've had to give up. Uh, for the big thing that God wants you to do and uh, what that looks like as, as Apostle Chuck would say keeping the end in view and so I've got I, I jotted some stuff uh, how the Apostle Paul's life was lived this way Moses's life was lived specifically this way and uh, you know Jesus's life was lived as a picture of this so yeah, if anybody wants one I'll go ahead and pass them out here oh thank you Jim all right no, I don't need it. It's okay. Yeah. I got it all on Evernote. That's what it is. But I just want to read a scripture for us this morning. It's, just, it's been stirring in my belly for a couple of days, just, uh, just the importance of a family. And uh, it's... Finally, on the way down here, I just had to, I just had to yank myself over and just start taking a few notes. And I want to read, if I could this morning, out of 1 Timothy, the third chapter. And it's, it's the qualifications for overseers, bishops, deacons, or, or anybody that is in leadership and capacity in the church. And it starts, I'll start with verse 1. It says, this saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to be an officer or in the office of an overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping the children in submission. For if, one, for if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the, I'm sorry, I lost my place, fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, and so that he may not fall into disgrace or into a snare of the devil. And it goes on, and it basically mirrors that same thing for, for deacons as well. And so, you know, in, in talking about this this morning, I am jealous for the family, really like never before. I feel like in our churches, in our broken society, you know, um, like 60%, and, and this is the norm, 60% of children or so are born out of wedlock today. 60%. In, in 1970, it was like 89% of children were born in 
the family unit with a mom and a dad. And so, you know, one of the big things, and me and Chip have talked about it a lot, one of the big things that I believe that we have got to get in this generation is our families. And, and, and as ministers, what I want to say, I want to say this, that our priorities, we've got to have the first things first. And the first thing is not the ministry, even though it can be so consuming. It's, it's God first, family second, ministry third. And I have to look at myself in the mirror every day and remind myself of that. Because I refuse to be the pastor who saves the world and loses his family. It's like a, you know, walking out, you know, I, I've always loved that Chip always tried to make it to all of his dad's or all, all of his kids' games as much as he could. Because you know what? Our church has many pastors, but they only had one dad, you know? And so, so when we talk about ministry, ministry is an overflow, I believe, at its highest and best. Ministry is an overflow of my relationship with my God and how that translates into my relationship with my family because that is the qualification in Scripture. Now, I want to break a few things down because I know good godly men and good godly women that are in ministry that have suffered divorce of none of their fault. I had to stand up with one of my ministers years ago and he was a good father, he was a good provider, he was a good protector and, and his wife just went crazy. And so we had to stand up in front of the church and I quoted this. That if you can't take care of your own household, you're not worthy to be a minister. And I said, so I'm going to stand beside this young man right now. And can anybody accuse him of not taking care of his family? Nobody could. So it came to the hard conclusion that even though you can take care of your family, children still have choices at times, right? Especially when they're older. And wives still have choices and husbands still have choices. And, and, and I just want to give this rebuttal to it. It says you got to be the husband of one wife, right? Well, the fact of the matter is, I don't think we have any polygamy going on here. You know, remember when Jesus caught the woman in adultery? Or not, not, not the woman in adultery, but uh, the woman at the well and said, uh, you know, bring your husband. And she says, I don't, I don't have a husband. And he said, you're right. You, you've had five and the one you're with right now isn't your husband. He didn't say, so he didn't recognize her as being married. I believe God gives second, third, fourth chances. So there's a, there's a whole lot of grace. I, I, I grew up in a denomination where you could have came out of a homosexual lifestyle and became a pastor under their denomination. But if you were divorced before, you couldn't. So it's just, it's just kind of messed up. But I want to say this. I believe husband and wife anointing is God's original intent. And original sin came in because there was a separation between the husband and the wife. And so I believe that the mystery of Christ, I don't think you can understand the kingdom without looking at a husband and a wife and a family. It's what it is. It's the great mystery. Ephesians 5 says, and, and we, we know this, he says, you know, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and the Savior of the body. So let wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. Right? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it, that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their selves. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord does the church. And so, husbands submit to their wives' need. Wives submit to their husbands' lead sometimes. And, and sometimes it can, it can go both ways. Basically, it's unto the Lord. But it goes on to say, oh yeah, I'm not speaking about husbands and wives. And it, it says, I'm actually declaring, declaring the great mystery of Christ in his church. And so to understand the kingdom 
is to understand the dynamics between a husband and a wife and a family. In fact, in Revelation, it says that an angel looks at John and says, come, let me show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he said, I saw a city coming down out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. And it was 1,500 miles by 1,500, and, and it talks about all of the wonderful things about that. And so God's kingdom is the dynamics of family. And so I just want to throw out this morning just a little bit, how do we do this in this generation? I remember when I first got married, <laughs> my wife was irritated at me for something, and we were about to walk in the church. And she didn't have that nice look on her face before she was going to go lead and praise and worship. And so I, I, I grabbed her by the arm before she went in, and I said, listen, you're going to have to change your face, or you're not coming to this church. I'm not speaking to you as your husband only right now. I'm speaking to you as a pastor, a person in leadership. And she did not like that one bit. I'll just tell you. But afterwards, she thanked me. Because she said, you did the right thing in that moment when it would have been a whole lot easier to just let me do what I wanted to do and try and make up with me later. And so, Chip, Chip and I always say this. I think one of the blights of church leadership right now is weak men. When we talk about strong men in this, it's not domineering, dominating. It's, it's, a, it's the exact opposite of that. But out of compassion and love and understanding and provision and protection, they have the right then to exercise a certain degree of authority in their house. And because of that, that overflows into the church. And, you know, wives, you know, the Bible, the Bible says with wives submitting themselves to their own husbands, uh, the reality is, is you're not submitting to them, you're submitting through them to the Lord. And so it looks different in our society kind of right now. And I believe that the world has got to see the real thing. They've got to see the real thing. They, they've got to see it in our families. And I, I know that I've got to do specific things. I talk about Chip because Chip is a good example of somebody that's loved and protected his family. We would pray, we, we still do, we pray every Thursday morning. We used to meet at 7 o'clock on Thursday mornings, and every morning Chip would be the first one to pray because he, he would never make it through the whole prayer meeting because he had his devotion with his family every morning before they went to school. And I'm like, no, nobody knew he did that, but maybe me and a couple other people. And so how do we build in our families the culture that will attract the world with cohabitation and the dysfunction and the wounds and most people getting married later and later and later in life, not understanding the, the commitment of covenant and the value of it and God's grace on your life when you, you live that way. And there's no such thing as a perfect marriage. There's no such thing as a perfect family. But if my family and my love for them and what God does in my family is an overflow of ministry that allows me to preach in the church, I want to focus on that because that's my primary. That's, that's not my secondary. And so what are some of the things that you do for anybody that's listening? What are some of the things that you do to covet your first thing outside of your relationship with the Lord, which is serving your family and loving your family? Apostles' kids are raised and love the Lord. And I've seen very diligent ministers through the years who were great ministers uh, and really loved the Lord, but they lost track of the primary of their family. I remember I was sitting with a prophet one time, and me and Melanie were eating with him, and uh, the way that he talked to his wife, just got my, well, she's a German girl, she, full of fire, just, you could just see her ears turning red. And we walked out and she says, 
I am never eating out with that guy again. I am not impressed. I could care less if he can give you name, rank, and serial number in the spirit. He just disqualified himself from being able to speak into my life. Because of what she saw in his home. Because if you're going to do that to your wife, you're going to misuse the bride of Christ also, which is very important. And so what are the, some of the things that you all have done or you aspire to do to keep your first things first? Apostle? Um, you talked about Chip going to games and that sort of thing. My wife and I made up our mind a long time ago that if we would, with our kids, if we would stay on their team, they would stay on our team. And so we tried very much to attend everything that our kids were doing, which were lots of different things. And I know that's a challenge. We didn't make it to everything, but usually at least one of us was able to, uh, to be there so that they would look up in the stands and we were there. We were supporting them and what they were doing at that point in their life. And uh, uh, we have observed, um, because of the school and everything, that there are kids who or maybe really outstanding athletes. Their parents never come one time to anything they ever do. And it's like, it just, it, it, it deflates them a certain amount because of that kind of support. Uh, I think it, it says something to the, the kid that I am important to my, to my parent. And I think, I think that uh, once again, we are, we are sending messages by the things that we do, the things that we don't do, the things that we allow, the things we don't allow. We're sending messages, and hopefully they're consistent messages that, of what is good and right and what is not good and what is not right. Uh, and you're right, we live in a, in a confusing time right now where um, all these children, you talked about 60% of all children born out of wedlock, I think all those people are born into disadvantage. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, please, God, would you please come and help us to help people before they do stuff like that? Not just help us to help these kids who are already in this situation. What is the, what is the preemptive thing that we could do maybe as the body of Christ to try to instill in a culture that seems to be headed in a, in a different direction? So. I remember growing up, um, I went to school with a guy, his, his name was Mansell, and uh, Mansell was born with a brain injury. And they said he'd never walk, they said he'd, he'd never succeed, he, you know, and he, would, he would always be very disabled, and, uh, but Mansell fought against it his whole life. And Chip remembers him, and he, uh, well, he couldn't do a jumping jack, he, his, his uh, you know, Equilibrium was too off, and, but he tried out for every sport. He ran track, he played football, and he wrestled. And it's like, when we would run in wrestling, we would run lap after lap after lap, and you know, we would cheat. After the first person got done, we would like do two laps and everybody else was done, because we had to count the laps. But Mansell wouldn't cheat. He would, he would, he'd be the only one still running on the track where we were going back up to the gym to wrestle. Or the coach would say, come on, Mansell, that's enough. Get in. And so it's like, oh, you're, just, you're just looking to say, oh, Mansell. I mean, it's, it's one thing to be a bench warmer in football, but there's no bench warmers in wrestling. Right? And so you would watch Mansell get out and he, he would just get pounded in wrestling every time. It was just, oh, no, Mansell. You know, be the water boy or something, you know, because you, you, you just hated to see somebody work so hard and not get a win as far as we, we saw. And I don't remember any other wrestling matches, but I remember Mansell going out one match in some weird turn of events, and Mansell ended up on top by accident or by miracle or God's grace, and he pinned the guy, and the whole team was like, Gosh, you know, and Mansell's jump, jumping up and down. And then we realized why Mansell did it, because his dad was at every game. His dad was sitting up in the stands. Dad ran down crying, hugging him. And, uh, you know, that means, like what Apostle said so much, being present in the moment. 
You know, we say what gets your attention gets your life. I, I have to make sure that when my little girls are jabbering, that I take the time to listen to them. You know, take the time to engage that. I think one of the things, uh, of course, uh, uh, my children are adults now, and, and, but it's still, there's something that I really try to practice, and it's, you really hit on it there. When they're talking, they're going to share their dream. They may not, if I was to ask them, they may not be able to share the dream, their, uh, the hope for their future. But when you're in communication and conversation with those kids, little bits of uh, that dream become revealed. And as parents, we ought to be able to key in on that because they got part of that dream through us. And so being able to recognize the dream, being able to help them understand timing, but also equip them. I mean, that's if, if you can't be the apostle of your own house, good luck trying to be an apostle, or your own family, good luck trying to be an apostle somewhere else. And, and being able to help them to fulfill that dream by equipping them and helping them to launch out in a right way. I saw a post that said, uh, you know, spoil your kids, you get to raise your grandkids. Raise your kids, you get to spoil your grandkids. Uh, I am one of those ones that uh, uh, went through the divorce of, of uh, no choice of their own. Um, I won't necessarily say no fault, but no choice. Um, but uh, I actually had a, uh, an incident happen a um, couple weeks ago. Uh, my ex-wife and my my the, the mother of my children is in uh, California. And uh, she wound up coming out here. Uh, their son was having an event. Um, he was graduating basic training. And uh, it wound up being close enough that uh, our boys were having an event at their high school. So they came down to go see the event. Um, and before the event, we actually met at the hotel and, and we sat down, we were all sitting in the same room talking. And a couple days later, uh, my son came to me. He said, Dad, I never thought I'd ever see that. Wow. The two of you in the same room talking, you know? And so it's important that even when we are um, going through things to show the love of Christ to our children of uh, just reconciliation and, and forgiveness um, and to be that example. And uh, sometimes it's hard, it's not easy, so. I think we have to put our family stuff on the schedule or life happens too. Billy Epperhart always told me this. He said, you got to depart daily, if at all possible. So I try at a certain point when I'm not traveling every day to sit down with my family and eat dinner together. With all the distractions, depart daily, withdraw weekly. That means one day a week is whatever they want to do. It's not my day off. It's my day off to do whatever they want to do. And out of that overflow, I always get what I want, which is that, to, to see them happy, and healthy, and holy, you know? And I gotta with, uh, withdraw weekly and abandon annually. Every year, we have got to get out of the metron of our geographical region. We, we, I, some people don't, some people can have staycations, I can't. I've gotta, I've gotta change the scenery and, and get away from, with my family and get some travel time in. And so I had to repent earlier this year because I had a lot of ministry opportunities with people that I, you know, and, and still do, I really wanna serve and I really wanna help. But I got way too ministry oriented at the beginning of the year. And I told my wife after uh, April, I said, I'm never gonna travel. I'm never gonna fill up my schedule like that ever again. And I've, I, thank you Jesus, I've, I've done a little bit better, or a whole lot better actually now but you know to spend that time how do you spell relationship uh you know yeah time and money that's it if you ever had kids time and money is how, how you do that one of the things that we also do is i think we need to have family traditions 
we started a new tradition this year, which is Advent. And so rather than cram everything about Jesus as far as his coming into one day, when all the kids are thinking about is the presents that they're going to get, we're, we're taking every day this month. We got, a, we got a big thing with all these little envelopes and number of the days, and we put a little card in each one of the days for the girls. And sometimes it's a devotional. Sometimes we are requiring them to be the gift to somebody else, go to school, witness, help somebody, buy somebody a coat. So, and, and then sometimes they pull it and so Willie Wonka a ticket. They actually get a surprise Christmas present earlier. Uh, but we decided that we're not going to buy a bunch of presents this year. We're going to take time to celebrate Jesus in the home every day this year. And our, you know, We've been doing it for a week or so, and I, I already feel different, you know, with the family. It's, it's beautiful. So do you guys have any good family uh, traditions that has, like, sealed in your heart? Daryl does. It's called hunting. <laughs> oh, oh, can I tell him? Hey, hey. Come to downtown, it bleeds over to your family. That kind of stuff can. So I, I thought I'm going to take care of this. So I went out and bought a gun. But it was a, it was a bubble gun. It shot, it shot bubbles, you know. It would oh, yeah. So you can change the atmosphere in your home, oh, but you've got to take the steps to do it. So I brought that home, and we had a lot of fun around that. And every once in a while, we'll say, mate, it might be time to get one of those guns out. <laughs> but uh, you, got, you, you got the ability to change the attitude. And that, you can part that. Yeah. You can part that. Too, so. I am. Uh, I want to tell him what, by the way, Daniel's got a job. He's working two or three days a week. And, and Daryl told me today, he said uh, he, got his, he got his paycheck and he made like $56 or something like that. And as only Daniel could, they said at the drive up window, uh, when they asked him how he wanted his money back, he said in hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I think with our families too, I think, you know, we got to pray together. We got to do devotions together. We got to have our daily bread with our families in, in that way. It's got to be, it can't be just something we do. It's, it's got to be a lifestyle. And for me, one thing that I have to do on a regular basis, whether, you know, us guys, we can assume certain things. And, it, you know, sometimes your wife doesn't want to put any more on you, so it's not said. And so I sit down with my daughters. And I sit down with my wife on a semi-regular basis, probably about once a month. And like I'll, I'll grab Amelia and I'll, we'll be talking. I'll say, she's 11. I'll say, are we okay? She's like, why? What's the matter, Dad? What do you think? I just want to know. I mean, really, are we okay? I look at Melanie and I say, are we okay? Is there anything I could change? Is there anything I could do better? Is, you know? She's like, yes, more dates, please. You know, more, but, you know, don't assume, you know, don't be insecure, but don't assume that everything's okay. You know, communication. Don't stop dating your spouse in, what is 73% of communications nonverbal? So, you know, Billy Epperhart uh, did a vlog a little bit ago, and he talked about he walked into this house with six kids back in the 70s when he was early a pastorate. And there's this little two-year-old that walked up and tried to hug the mother. And the mother shoved the two-year-old back and said, we're not a hugging family. Said it to the two-year-old. And so I would challenge us. I think we're, we're, we're more Southern culture. Hug as much as you possibly can. Because when God formed man, he formed him with a touch. He formed him with a touch and he breathed the pneuma the breath of life into him. And ever since then, we are people that need to be touched by somebody. And so. So um, I have kind of the curious uh, lifestyle because I actually grew up in ministry and I still love it. So like, you know, I, I, I will say I made it. It's amazing. It's victorious. Um, and then I took things over. So it's, I'm now addicted to it. So all the fun things. But I remember when my family got on the road and I'm so thankful for this gift as a kid, but my mom sat with a whole bunch of ministry individuals and asked them, 
if you could do it differently, what would you do? And the two things that she got back were, um, don't put them in the front row every single time you're preaching. They don't, you know, they, and they made a rule for us. It's like, we were requested, especially when we got to teenagers, we only had to go to one service a week. Um, and then the rest of it was just like, you can come, or you can stay behind, or if you just need a space. So it was, that was a gift for me as a kid, because you know, the wonderful thing about being a traveling minister is that you only need like five or six sermons, and you're set for the whole like, year. And um, you know, there's only so many stories that you want to hear over and over again, but they're still wonderful. But, um, <laughs> but that was such a wonderful gift. But I think the biggest thing that I've been catching um, was they also gave us a pause button which was if my brother and I ever felt like it was getting too much, the pressure was too much on, we were missing them, or we just needed to stop traveling for a minute, we can come to my parents and say, we need a break. And that was such a wonderful gift. I think we only pushed the button once, and I think it was like after three or four months of living in Canada or something like that, and dad was in a prison every other night or something like that. And like, no, we're, we need family time or something like that. So he paused. We had two weeks where we were just like, it's just us. We had our vacation, and I'm really thankful for that. So that's something I'm carrying on in my family. Like, I have young kids, and you know, it, I don't want them to be in the place where I'm taking care of other people's kids, but not taking care of them. So I told them if mommy needs a break, we're going to have a break. And it's okay to tell me what you need. <laughs> That's awesome. God ingrains Sabbath into everything. And not all of our paces are the same. S Sabbath to apostle might look different than, you know, Sabbath with you. But uh, no, it's definitely needed. I heard the story a long time ago about a... Um, a famous minister, he wrote books, he taught at a Christian college and that sort of thing. It was many years ago down in Texas. And his son, well, his son got lost in the shuffle somewhere. So he's out on the motorcycle and he's drinking and drugging and whatever. Word comes one night in the summertime that uh, his son's been killed. And he said, all over the campus, they could hear this man wailing because this is before air conditioning, so everybody's got their windows up. And he said, another man's vineyard I have ten tended, I have not tended my own vineyard. It was the regret of, of a life of, everybody thought he was wonderful. He's such a wonderful man of God. He's written all these books and it's all this. But just what Dan said, but what do you gain if you lose your own family in the, in the, for the sake of ministry? There's something not right about that. I don't think God ever intended for ministry to be so dominant, such a dominant part of your life that uh, uh, that's the case. Another thing is that, uh, you know, when we, we began the church, uh, we were young, had, we had children, young children like Dan does now, although I, wasn't, I was younger than you, but <laughs> you just got a late start, I guess. But... Uh, you know, so my wife had to put, she put a lot of things on the back burner in order to raise children. Uh, she was a teacher. She, she quit teaching for a number of years to stay home and raise our children when they were young. At the same time, we're building this church. I'm gone. I got meetings and got to meet with, got to go to the hospital, got to do all the stuff you do as a minister. And uh, I remember one night, uh, and we we're in a prayer meeting. And uh, I heard the Lord say, go home and pray with your wife. And I thought, you know, I can't, Lord, I'm responsible. I'm the leader of this. I got to be here. Like, go home. I, you know, I'm, you're not hearing anything else but this. So I turned it over to somebody else. I went home and my wife, she's there, of course, with our two little kids. And it was like, uh, she, I walked in the door and she said, well, you're home early tonight. I said, yeah. The Lord told me to come home and pray with you. And she started to cry. And I thought, there's something going on here that I'm not aware of. And that is that sometimes your family begins to think that they are way, way low on your list of, of priority and importance. And, and I, I'm telling those two stories uh, because 
it was during that period of time. Plus, <laughs> um, growing up in a church that has a prophet is, is wonderful at times. And, uh, but there was a meeting one night, and Minard said, I think I have a word for you. And basically, this was, it was kind of lengthy, but it was like, if you don't do right by your family, those of your household will become your worst enemies, which is actually a scripture. And I thought, how long you worked here not counting today? You know what I mean? <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> <laughs> and the problem was, I knew he was right. And uh, it was one of those things you have, to, you have to learn the priorities because sometimes in ministry we think that what we're doing is so important. And I think we should think that what we're doing is vitally important. But, we, but it is about priorities. And uh, I, I'd heard a man say one time too that, you know, a lot of times a, a, a wife has children. She's got that, she has dreams and visions too. But she puts a lot of those things on hold, which was the message you were going to preach. What, what have we forsook in order to accomplish something else? That They put these things on hold. And uh, so one of the, the things that uh, uh, I think I've been finding myself doing most recently is uh, she helped me build a dream that I had. So more recently, I've been trying to help her build a dream that she has. And I think that that is, 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 is right. Uh, I think it is, it's, uh, it's important. Uh, and it's not about, well, what they're doing is not like the church work or something like that. I'm thinking, if it's what God's called them to do, it's the work of God anyway. Whatever it is, whatever it is that they're doing, you know, I mean, whatever that thing is. And so... Um, I see the, the wisdom of that, and sometimes we get stuck in, as ministers, we can get stuck in, what I'm doing is the only important thing that goes on in this family, and it's like, no, it's not. It's your wife maybe had dreams and visions from God herself. And, that's and it's like, then at some point, I want to help her dream her dreams and fulfill her dreams as well. So, so. As you're talking about that, um, the fa you know, this is all about family. I think every person that you have brought into the church that had an apostolic grace on their life always does two things that I, just me watching, I've seen them do two things. They bring order, but they also bring what I call strain relief or they bring support to the, the pastors of the church. Bob Lemon would come in, he would teach on helps. He would show us. And you talk about an apostolic grace, man, because it helped us to recognize. I mean, we, we didn't know what we didn't know. And so that apostolic grace... So Architectural. He got into architectural things. How do we actually do this stuff? Yes. We just need to be a more wonderful church. We need to love each other. And everybody. And then, how do we do that? Right. Somebody actually tell you what you've done here today is a lot of that same stuff too. I'm just sitting there listening to that. The practical things. This is what we do. This is how we do it. These are ideas. Not that this is the only idea, but sometimes people just need to kind of hear something. Yeah. Well, and then Chuck, he come in, and I can say we, we really didn't like it at first, but he activated the people, man. He pulled it right, and he pulled them up and said, what do you do here? Well, if I didn't do anything, they were going to be embarrassed in front of the whole church, and he was embarrassed for them, and I'm thinking, I don't know who to be embarrassed for. I, I'm, you know, it, never seen anything like, but it was this apostolic grace, so if, uh, I think of Billy Epperhart. He, he has, he come in and showed us uh, church structure. And it brings an order every time, but it also should bring a, bring a liberation to the leadership. And all these men that I've mentioned and others that I'm not mentioning always have done those two things, bring order and take some of the weight off of the leadership. And that's true apostolic grace and that's a true apostolic covering. And I just feel like if, if how do we do this with making our, keeping our families strong, stay under 
the covering of apostles and the fivefold ministry? Because I, I do. I believe that the apostolic is uh, the nature of the apostolic, not the office, but the nature of the apostolic people is, is a, a father, mother, family, nurture by nature, you know, spirit. And so anybody else have anything? I want to see our families so rock solid. One thing we, we've done ever since I can remember after church, the fa our kids and grandkids all come over for Sunday dinner. I think that's so important. Oh, wow. and another thing I did when our kids were little, I'd pray over them before they went to bed. And it, with our grandkids, I've got a blessing. They probably know it by heart. Even his age, if they're at our house and they stay all night, they get their blessing. And I think that's so important. That's powerful. Well, I believe that I'm going to start praying for some of these relationships to come into arm, to come into our life that really have a grace for healing marriages, healing broken kids like Susanna and, and what she does with this you know, father or father motherless or great grandma raising you. Uh, my, my little girl was at school and she got a culture shock going to public school. I mean, just, and a little boy in her class said, what are you so excited about? She said, I get to spend that with my grandma tonight, is what Amelia said. And he said, yeah, it's fun until it becomes the eternal trip to grandma's. And it's like, she's like, I, I don't even know how to handle that. No, no concept of that whatsoever. I, so I'm believing, uh, if you would pray with me, there are certain people that have certain anointings for certain things. I really want to see some marriage, some strong marriage teachers come into our network and talk about some of the taboos. And I know one of them, I actually taught a couple of... Uh, uh, a couple months back in Orlando, or in October, in Orlando with him. He's a guy by the name of Steve Miller. And uh, everybody remember the Steve Miller band? You know, he said, he, he, he stood up to teach and he said, Hi, I'm still, uh, I'm Steve Miller, but some people call me Maurice. Does anybody remember that song? And so, uh, but him and his wife, they taught on marriage down in uh, Florida. And it was some of the best teaching I'd ever heard in my life. Danny Silk is another one. When he hits on marriage, you know, he's got something to say. So uh, if it's okay with you, I want to pray for our marriages. I want to pray for our families. You know, I want us to keep the first things first, the primary as primary. And so, Lord, I just ask this morning, I thank you for my family. I thank you for having the privilege of getting together this morning just for a little bit. Lord, I ask that you would teach us through marriage and raising children and grandparents and family the mystery of your kingdom, which is you and your bride. Help us to see the, that picture, Lord God. Help us to replicate. That is on earth as it is in heaven, when, not just when we're feeding the poor or we're building bigger buildings, but when we see healthy, happy, holy families coming together, loving each other, Lord. I pray for healing in our arm family this morning. If there's, if there's fractures, if there's brokenness in our family tree, Lord God, I pray, Lord God, that in the spirit that you would dig it and dung it and give it another year, that our, our, our family trees would become fruitful. Once again, if any of us have any wayward children where the seeds have been sown into their heart at an early age and they've decided to be a prodigal or figure things out on their own, I pray, Lord God, that there would be a holy summons to our families this morning, that the Holy Ghost of God would begin to touch their hearts. Unless they're drawn by the Spirit, you said, they'll no wise enter therein. So I pray for a total recall in a new season. Lord, I, I pray this morning that you would help us to navigate the times and seasons with our relationships with our wife because, Lord, the woman I'm married to now is not the girl I married back then. And so our marriages and our families, are, they're a living document. 
There's changes, there's adjustments, things are growing, there's different perspectives. So help us to navigate in the seasons, whether it's if we have babies in the house or an empty nest and we had kids at an early age and now we're having to know each other in a new way in a new season. So Lord, I ask for that grace as well. Oh Lord, I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I had a I had a um, one of my pastors <clears throat> look at me and I said I said how you doing? It's, it's one of our churches. He's one of our lead pastors. He said I'm going crazy. Is what what's happening? He said if it was not for prayer, he said I'll tell you what. He said I he said I've never wanted to ride a motorcycle or get a tattoo in my whole life. He said he said but I'm telling you he he's like 46 years old. He said I don't know what's going on in me. He said if it was not for prayer, he said I would be going crazy. He said this midlife crisis stuff is real. It's real. Him and his wife are entering into a new season, having to know each other in a new way without kids in the house anymore. I said, you know what midlife crisis is? It's puberty for old folks. That's, it. That's really what it is. Remember when you were 17 and you were 12 years old and all? You were irritated, didn't know. Who, old enough to know better, too young to resist. Just... <laughs> That's, that's what happens in, in, in your midlife crisis, too. I said, I know. I, I know it's real. So I said all that to say this. With our families, we've got to figure and got to get to know each other in these new times because God is making us again another in certain seasons. So, all right, I bless you. Thank you, Apostle. That's good. That's good. Let's stand. We're, let's, uh, we're not going to pray again. He just prayed, but... Uh, <clears throat> Just a reminder, we've got the R&R &R coming up in uh, February, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, just being able to hang out with, with some good folks, and uh, I think this is, it's important, whether, whatever we do at a meeting or not is not maybe nearly as important as maybe just what we're talking about here, just taking the time, getting away, uh, hanging out with each other, doing life together, and uh, so... Looking forward to that. I think there's always something of value in that. I know uh, uh, somebody had asked uh, the question about can we invite other people to come, and I said, yeah, we can do that. And so I know Caleb has made a friend with the uh, pastor at the Sellersburg United Methodist Church, and he and his wife are wanting to come. So, uh, you know, it's like we're just there to hang out. We, we're not there's no trade secrets being shared at this meeting, things that outsiders can't listen to, or we're not, that's not who we are, that's not what we're about. So uh, we just want to be an encouragement to one another. And uh, let's see, is it the uh, 8th, 9th, 10th? It, it's whatever, wherever the Super Bowl is. That's when it is. Look it up on, <laughs> Google it, and it's, we start on that Sunday night. Uh, I mean, s some people don't come to Monday, which is fine, but we're there, and then we're there till Wednesday. Okay? I always, I always thought it was just the first uh, Sunday and Monday and Tuesday of February. Yeah. And then I found out that was totally wrong. It's right. whatever Super Bowl. That, <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, well, God bless you.